Y'all, we have made it to the edge of the promised land. We are in our final week, and I can hardly believe that we have journeyed these last 11 weeks for us, 40 years for them, through this wilderness. Um, Before we dive in, I do want to open us up in prayer because I just um, feel such um, a powerful reminder tonight of um, who God is. And um, I want us to just be humbled and I want us to have hands that are open and minds that are open and hearts that are open to hear what he has for us as we finish this um, study in the wilderness. So um, will y'all pray with me? (sighs) Father, you have walked with us. You walked with the Israelites. And Lord, today, as we talk about the crossing of the Jordan and as we celebrate um, Passover with the Israelites, Lord, is in our study. God, I just pray that you would show yourself, Lord, that you would teach us. Lord, I pray that my mouth would be your instrument, that Lord, you would um, teach me in the moment what to say, Lord, that you would let the word of truth come forth, Lord, and that you um, would let it fall, let it produce growth, and let it draw us closer to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, before we finish um, tonight, I thought it would um, be a great place if we rewound all the way back um, a few hundred years to the very beginning of the promise that we are going to see begin to be fulfilled in our study um, this week. Genesis 15, 12 through 19 Um, This is when God makes a covenant with then Abram. It's before he has changed his name to Abraham. And um, this is what it says. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. And will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nations that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant to Abram saying, to your offspring, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephraim and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, Gergesites, Shites, and the Jebusites, all the ites. He made a covenant with Abram saying, I will give the off, your offspring this land. And today we are going to see them take that step into the promised land, into the land that God promised Abram his descendants would have. I want to recap the study Um, Just quickly, before we dive into um, Joshua 3 through 5 tonight, but we started our study in Exodus 12, where they celebrated the Passover. God gave them this memorial feast to help them remember God's salvation and his deliverance, how he had saved them from the 10th plague. He provided favor over them. Remember, they made no provisions for themselves, but they left full. They left with the great possessions that God had promised Abram they would. They left with the jewelry and the very much cattle. In Exodus 13, God gives them this command to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would help them remember the day that the Lord brought them out of Egypt when they left in haste with the unleavened bread. And he led them 
not by the way of the Philistines, not the short way, but by way of the wilderness. And he provided for them there the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night to lead them and to guide them and to be with them. In Exodus 14, God held back the waters of the Red Sea and the people crossed over into the wilderness on dry ground. And in Exodus 15, God gave them a song to remember how he got the glory over Pharaoh. And we read in um, verse 31 that Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Remember, God has brought them out there to show them who he is. In Exodus 15, he made the undrinkable bitter water drinkable and sweet. And he revealed his name, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord, your healer. This is where um, we saw that he is not necessarily um, the healer, uh, talking about the healer of our bodies, while that is true, but he is the healer of our souls. He provided for them Elam, a place that had been prepared just for them with the 12 springs and 70 palms. And it was a place of rest and refreshment and abundance in the midst of their wilderness. In Exodus 16, God provided bread from heaven, manna that they gathered for six days. And miraculously, every day, it was exactly what they needed. No more, no less. And on the sixth day, a miracle where they had a double portion. Um, and then God provided a day of ceasing, a day of rest, a Sabbath day. He was proving them and building their trust in him. In Exodus 17, he brought water from the rock and the Israelites' victory in their first battle against the Amalekites where Aaron and Hur held up the arms of Moses. It's the place where we met Joshua who took the army down to the valley to fight. God reveals his name, Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is our banner. He is our hope, our refuge, and our victory. In Exodus 19 and 20, we witness God making a covenant with his people. We likened it to a marriage ceremony where God gave them the law as a definition of their relationship. He said in um, 19, five through six, now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my command, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He reveals his name jealous. He is intolerant of rivalry, not because he's selfish and not because he just thinks he's pretty awesome, because he knows that our very best life lies in full surrender to him. He knows that what can satisfy us for eternity can only be found 100% in him. And he writes this covenant with his own hand on two tablets to be a memorial of the covenant that he made with the people. But we see in Exodus 32 that the people basically commit adultery at the wedding ceremony. And Moses comes down and he breaks the symbol of that covenant because it's as if it was null and void. He goes before God on behalf of the people. He intercedes for them and so um, returns with a new covenant. God faithfully renews the covenant with two new stone tablets. And Moses says, show me your glory. And God passes before him, puts him in the cleft of the rock and allows him to see his backside. And he declares his name to him, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity on the father of the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. He reminds Moses again that his name is jealous and the people leave Sinai. We saw in Numbers 9 how they moved through the wilderness in the midst, um, God's glory dwelt in the midst of the camp after the, the construction of the tabernacle. And when God moved, they moved. And when God stayed, they stayed. We um, saw in Numbers 13 and 14, the people reject the promised land at the report of the spies. 
And while Moses does intercede for them and God does forgive them, the punishment of their sin of not continuing to trust God to be faithful to do what he said he would do to Abram, their dead bodies fall in the wilderness. And so instead of entering in, they turn back and spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. In Numbers 19, God again provides water for the rock. He showed his holiness and his glory, despite the fact that Moses did not uphold him as holy and his punishment. Now Moses and Aaron too will not enter the promised land. Numbers 20, God sends a plague of serpents when the people call the manna worthless. Again, Moses intercedes and God provides a way of salvation. If they look upon the bronze serpent on the pole, they will be saved. It's a shadow of our savior, Jesus, who would come not to condemn, we read in John 3, because we are already condemned, but to save. God continues to provide water and the people sing a song to, as a memorial that God has provided springs in the wilderness. He provided victory over the first of the ites, the two Amorite kings, um, and so begins to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham, giving the land of Canaan to the people. As we moved into Deuteronomy 31 and 32, we see God provide a new leader as Moses is preparing to die. And he gives the people one of the greatest gifts in one of the greatest ways that we still to this day have to remember. And it's the first five books of this, our Bible. It is the books of the law, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. He says, these are no empty words for you, but your very life. Don't forget them. Do what it says and so live long in the land that God is giving you. And in Deuteronomy 34, Moses climbs the mountain one final time. And with God looks out on the land he will not enter and then dies and God buries him. And then finally, last week, we moved into Joshua, a new uh, leader of the people. And God confirms him and establishes him and says, I will be with you just as I was with Moses. And we see the people saying, yes, we will obey all that you say to do, we will do. And because God is with them, Joshua lacks nothing. He is able to be strong and courageous, growing resolute and firm in faith and remaining steadfastly minded. God then gives them an example of what it means to walk in obedience, not just to believe, but to believe and to act. We saw God go before them as he prepared a safe place in the house of Rahab for the two spies as they go to spy out the land. And because she heard the testimony of God's power, she believed. She didn't stop there. She then obeyed. And God gave us this example throughout scripture in multiple places where we see point back to the obedience of Rahab. And the spies come back and go, we can do this. And that is where we are going to pick up today. The people are on the banks of the Jordan River about to cross over to, to begin the fulfillment of the prophecy given to Abraham. If you are ready, let's jump into Joshua chapter three, uh, verse one. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim and they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of the three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the ark of the Lord, your God being carried by the Levit Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. We see again here God's holiness. They say it's go time. 
When you see the Ark of the Covenant pass before you, follow it. But stay back 2,000 cubits. That was about half a mile, just over half a mile. It's about 3,000 feet. Um, and we see his because of his holiness, remember, there has to be distance. We've seen that throughout um, when Moses was on the mountain, when God came down in Exodus 19 and 20 and 32 and 33, where they had to consecrate themselves, they had to cleanse themselves, and then they had to stand at a certain distance so as to protect themselves, not because God doesn't want them to come near, but because he knows it's for their protection. He knows they will die if they get too near to his presence, because sin cannot stand in the presence of holiness without dying. Um, and that's going to be a really important thing that we see um, later this uh, in our study this week. So God is going to go before them. He's leading them. And I love that phrase. He's saying that um, follow me because otherwise you won't know where to go. You have not passed this way before. And I think that is so true of our lives every day that we need to remember that we cannot move ahead of God, that we must continue to follow where he leads because we, um, we do not know which way we are going unless he leads us where to go. And he says, Joshua says, the Lord is about to do wonders among you. He's saying, be expectant, be alert, watch for God. When he moves, you move. Verse seven, and the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that I was with Moses. So I, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests to bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail Drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Um, behold, the Ark of the Covenant of, of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, each Try uh, from each tribe a man, and when the soles of your the feet of the priest bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood, rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarephan and flowing down toward the Sea of Araba, the Salt Sea were completely cut off and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until the whole nation had passed over, finished passing over the Jordan. So the Jordan River looks very much different today than it did back then. Um, in fact, um, one of the encyclopedias I was kind of reading through trying to find some information about the Jordan talked about how um, the amount of water that flows through the Jordan is, um, if I remember correctly, it's about a fourth to a fifth of what it used to be. Um, don't quote me on that, but it is a significant reduction of the amount of water that flows. And the Jordan, um, it notes here in verse 15 that the Jordan overflows at all of its banks at the time of harvest. This is during the flood season. And the Jordan um, River, as the flood season, it would expand the river, it would make it wider, um, and it would flow onto the banks. And so it would be um, 
it wasn't like a gradual kind of like dip through the river. It was a drop. And on top of that, um, it is in, so if you look kind of at the topography of this region, the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River runs through a very deep valley. Um, it starts north of the Sea of Galilee, and you can see this in your map, um, at the foot of Mount Hermon where there are springs of water. It comes into the Sea of Galilee, and then it goes um, out the Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea. So it actually flows downhill. Um, the Mount Hermon is above sea level and the um, Salt Sea or the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. It's um, over a thousand feet below sea level. And so because of the trajectory of this river, it flows very quickly for this size river. It's actually not a huge, massive wide river, but at this time of year, it was wider than it usually is and it flows very fast. And so notice the priests had to step into this raging river first before the waters were rolled back. And so they had to, with faith, while carrying the presence of God. So um, while the priests would have to go through a very um, strict um, cleansing and purification process, and they were actually carrying the tabber, or the Ark of the Covenant on poles. So they are not touching the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and so they have to step into the water before the water can roll back. And we say here that they do step out in faith. And as the presence of God rests in the waters, and do you notice how many times this is the Lord of all the earth, the Lord of all the earth um, is, is resting in the Jordan the water stops flowing and it piles up in one heap up at the city of Adam, all the way down to the Dead Sea where the river ends. It's 17 miles of river that is completely and suddenly dry ground. They were completely cut off. And the nation of Israel crosses over the Jordan on dry ground and the people of God step into the promised land. And God is going to command them again to build a memorial to remember. Joshua 4, when all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, each um, tribe a man, and command them saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly. Notice how he's multiple times pointed to how they stood firmly. Um, we talked about this with the Red Sea, that um, it's not like he just rolled the water back and it was muddy and mushy and it was hard. It was firm, dry ground. Um, and bring them over with you and lay them in the place where you lodge tonight. And Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And he said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in the time to come what do these stones mean to you then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan the waters of the Jordan were cut off so the stone shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And we see the people do just as, as Joshua has commanded them to. They each go take a stone from the river. This is a stone that is natural. It is not one that has been carved by human hands. Um, it has not been defiled by a tool. Remember his holiness um, point. Anytime a human, this is what made the golden calf uh, so much more of a sin was the fact that he fashioned it with a graving tool. So this is going to point them to the God who held the waters back. He is not saying that he, the, the goal is not to tell their children that, um, notice he doesn't just stop at uh, the waters were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. Um, it's the fact that um, they were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. It was the fact that they were cut off before the presence of God. 
And so he says, take these 12 stones. And um, they took the 12 stones in the place where the feet of the priest bearing the ark had stood. Um, and um, I'm going to pick up in verse 10 for the priest bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, the people passed over in haste. I love that they obeyed in haste. They didn't delay their obedience. When the waters were cut off, they walked over. And then when um, it was commanded, they grabbed the stones, they grabbed the stones and they get back out. They, um, and when all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priests passed before, um, over before the people, um, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them. So remember those two and a half tribes had land on the east side of the Jordan River, but the um, men were to come with them to continue the battle to fight for the land that was on the east side. Um, and uh, picking up in 13, about 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the Ark of the Testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests to come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones, which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord, your God, dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we pass over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. One of the things that I noticed about these passages in Joshua um, was that we do see the people obeying and not grumbling. There is a renewed um, sense of of commitment of these people to follow and to obey. They crossed over in haste. They didn't delay their obedience. They grabbed the 12 stones and um, they set up this memorial at Gilgal. And again, we see him point to the importance of being able to point back to that stone and tell their children, tell the next generation to come why those stones are there. Um, and one of the things we've seen him do this repeatedly, we've seen um, these altars set up, we've seen the songs, we've seen the jar of manna placed before, all of them are to point us to remember. And I think one of the things we've talked about is that, yes, um, they're all tools for us to remember. But I think one of the things that we've kind of glossed over is the fact that God commands them to remember. Part of our obedience is remembering who God is through um, these mighty works that he has done. And he um, knows our Hebrews 2, 1 hearts. He knows our tendency to drift. And so he commands them to remember, to let it be a testimony, um, to let these stones remind them, not only that he he split the Jordan and they walked on dry ground, but that it was the Lord, their God, who did it. It points to the power. Um, and I want to note two kind of important little details that we probably might gloss over. This one caught me when I was reading. Um, actually, I had read through this several times before, and I was listening to it. This is why I love listening to scripture in an app, because you'll catch things that you don't catch when you're reading. 
I heard um, the girl that was reading it say the 10th day of the first month. And I went, I've heard that before. And I went back in my notes and I found Exodus 12, one through three, the very first verses of this study. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for the household. And then God gives them the, um, the Passover. He gives them the instruction for the Passover feast. The day that they were to take the lamb um, into their house to be sacrificed for the Passover meal a few days later was the first day of, or the 10th day of the first month. And here, fast forward 40 some, a little bit extra years, and we see the Israelites crossing into the Jordan on the very same day, the day that the Passover preparations were to begin. Y'all, we have a God who is in every detail and his timing is so deliberate. He led them across the Jordan on this day for a very specific purpose. Because if you'll remember, He said that when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you are to keep this feast as a memorial to remember. And he wastes no time in, you know, they didn't cross six months and have to wait before they celebrated the Passover. The very first thing that he wants them to do when they walk into the promised land is to Celebrate the feast that will help them remember that he is the God of deliverance, that he is the God who saved them. He is the one who passed over them. And so they cross on the 10th day of the first month. And then I don't want us to miss the purpose of all of this because he could have led them a different way. They could have come up through the South. They could have, you know, gone around the other way. But verses 23 and 24, the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. Remember, um, very few of these, they would have been children when they crossed the Red Sea. Um, Remember that whole generation that was of war age, that was 20 and older, passed away in the wilderness. And so this is a new generation. Um, And so Joshua is saying, the Lord did it for us at the Red Sea, and now he's doing it for y'all here at the Jordan, so that, that's a transitional word for us to remember, so that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. All of this was to show his might with the um, with the next step of fearing the Lord. Our, this, our response to his greatness, our response to his power, our response to getting a right view of God should old, always lead us toward more awe of him. He um, did these miracles not to get them into the promised land. He did them to show the whole earth, not just them, the whole earth, us included, the power and the might, and that it might lead us toward awe. I read an article on the Gospel Coalition this past week um, by Thaddeus Williams. He's an associate professor of systematic theology at Biola University. And the article is talking about this idea of self-worship that is kind of running rampant through our society today. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes, the show description. But um, he had this quote in there and it just struck me. He said, we were never meant to trust in or be defined by, satisfy in, satisfied in or captivated by ourselves. 
we were made to revere someone infinitely more interesting and awesome than ourselves. We become most truly and freely ourselves in a state of self-forgetful reverence. And that is what God is calling us to. Not because he thinks he's better than us or he's more important than us. Because he knows that our very best lies in full surrender to him. That is why we have seen that theme of his jealous nature over us, over our hearts. Because he wants us. We were not made to be satisfied and defined by our own selves. We were meant to live in awe of him. And it is only when we allow the things that go on around us to, for us to see him in our midst, for us to remember what he did, his power and his might and his character. This is why um, I teach through God-centered Bible study is that we need to get a right view of God and we need to allow that view of him to lead us toward more awe and reverence. Because when we see him as he is, then we see ourselves as we are. And we recognize that we are unable to save ourselves, that we are so much in need of a savior. We so often see God's might and we power and we see him move in our life and we're like, thanks God. And we move on. But we must remember, it's not so much what he did, it's who he proved himself to be. Not always looking for what God can do, but seeing his presence in our midst. They were still in the wilderness for 40 years. He didn't remove them from the hard circumstances, but he was there with them every single step of the way. And he was proving his character over and over and over and over and over all that it might lead to more trust in him. So we move into Joshua chapter five and into the final verses of our stories from the wilderness Bible study. As soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the West and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea had heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over their hearts melted. And there was no longer in the spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Y'all, we saw this in Joshua 2 as Rahab was kind of recounting. They had heard of the Red Sea and she said their hearts melted. They had lost hope. Um, why? Why did they lose hope? Um, I did some deeper research this week. And um, one of the things that um, is really important to note culturally is that in Canaan, one of their chief gods was Baal. Baal, um, I'm gonna read a quote from Encyclopedia Britannica. Braille, Baal designated the universal God of fertility. And in that capacity, his title was Prince or Lord of the earth. He was also called the Lord of rain and dew, the two forms of moisture that were indispensable for the fertile soil in Canaan. In Ugaritic and in Hebrew, Baal's epithet as the storm god was he who rides on the clouds. In the Phoenicians, he was called Baal Shaman, the Lord of the heavens. What they believed Baal was this supreme god who was Lord of the earth who had power over water. And what did God do? He didn't bring the Israelites up through the South. He brought them across a raging river that to them they thought was their protective border. And God rolled back and they stood on dry ground. And that meant that God had power over water. Notice how many times Joshua points to the fact that, that God our God is Lord of the earth, not Baal. He is Lord over the earth. He is Lord over the water. He is sovereign and supreme Yahweh over everything. And in doing so, the Amorites and the Canaanites and all the ites knew were in trouble because their God is defeating their God. And it's really, and this is why this detail is here again. So I'm going to keep reading and then we're going to come back. Um, so God is showing all the people who he is. Don't forget that. And so God is showing even 
the people that he um, is coming, that they are coming for who he is. So verse two, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at the really hard name of the place to say, Gilbeth Harahalath. I probably butchered that. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them all. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt and all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way, af on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who had come out of Egypt perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. So we see um, that, you know, they're pointing back. These are the children. These are the ones, most of whom were all born in the wilderness and they had not been circumcised. And so um, they needed to be circumcised. So I want to jump back to Genesis 17, 1 through 14. Um, so this is when God makes a second covenant with Abram and he um, tells him he's going to make him fruitful. He's going to make him the father of many nations. Kings are going to come for you. I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring throughout the generations. It's an everlasting covenant to be your God. Um, and they mark this covenant. He changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Um, and in verse nine, he says, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you should keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout all generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between you and me. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money for any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. So God has set this sign of the covenant between him and the people of Israel, that they should be circumcised. So remember, we've talked about how they were set apart. They were a people who were um, peculiar. They were different. They had something that marked only them. And this is the sign that, of the covenant that God had made between them. And we saw um, in um, even back in Exodus 12, when he's talking about celebrating the Passover, he said, all males must be sacked, may, uh, let all his males be circumcised, um, that in order to take Passover, they had to be circumcised, okay? So they've crossed in on the 10th day of the first month, which is the first day of the preparation of Passover. And so in order for them to continue and to celebrate Passover, they have to be circumcised. Um, and so they're going to get circumcised, but here's what happens. Okay, so they have to go through a healing process in order. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't take long because four days later, they're going to celebrate Passover. But here's the big thing. Okay, so back in Genesis, um, there is this story where um, in Genesis 24, there's two sons of Jacob, their sister has been raped. And so as a way to avenge this um, kingdom that has defiled their sister, they tell them, oh, yeah, 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 we'll um, let you marry our sister if you guys all get circumcised. And so they're like, okay, great. So they get circumcised. And on day two, they go and attack them. And they kill all of them and take their, like, plunder their, their kingdom and, um, and kill the man who had raped their sister. So this is why it's so important. So backing up to that first verse. It is so important because in order for them to follow through in the obedience of being circumcised, it was going to leave them vulnerable. That meant it was, they were going to have to trust that God was going to protect them in that time of healing from those kingdoms coming and, um, and attacking them. And so the fact that God went before them in this way to make sure that the whole earth all these people knew 
that he was the supreme God, that Baal was not the God who was going to protect them, and that their days were numbered so that their hearts would melt, so that they wouldn't attack the Israelites while they were healing from their circumcision so that they could follow through in the obedience of what God had called them to do. Y'all, that's a lot, I know. But oh my goodness, like our God is in every single detail. He is such a God of order and he is so deliberate in every step that he takes and in every time that he takes those steps. He has led them. And in verse nine, it says, the Lord said to Joshua, today, I have rolled away the approach from Egypt from you. And so they named the place Gilgal to this day. Gilgal means to roll away. Matthew Henry says in his commentary, they were hereby owned to be freeborn children of God, having the seal of the covenant. When God glorifies himself in perfecting the salvation of his people, he not only silences all enemies, but rolls back their reproach upon themselves. He took away the shame of their past slavery and they are now marked children of God. The Lord has gone before them and then they celebrate Passover. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And on the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain, and the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. God's provision led them all the way. He took them from um, Egypt all the way into the promised land. He provided for them every step of the way. They never grew hungry once the manna started. Do you think about that? Like we never saw them complaining about being hungry because they always had exactly what they needed. They complained about some other things, but they had God show up for them miraculously every single day. Deuteronomy 29.5 says that he has led them 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. For 40 years, God made their clothes and their sandals carry them and clothe them and protect them. And they have entered into the place that God had promised their father, Abraham. And he has rolled back from Adam to the Dead Sea. He has taken away and rolled back the reproach and the shame of their sin. And just like us, we were cut off from him. We were cut off from the promised land, from heaven. All the way back to Adam, we were dead. Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. But then came Jesus. First, uh, Romans 5, 18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, like the Ark of the Covenant, like the presence of God, because he is the presence of God, goes before us. And he goes where we have been cut off. And because of our sin, we could not cross over. But because of his sacrifice, we were not his people. But he then allowed, um, went before us and he removed our sin and he removed our shame. And we were not his people, but then Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him 
having forgiven all our trespasses and canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Because of Jesus, we are no longer cut off. We are no longer left to wander the wilderness. And though now here we suffer for a little while, y'all, the promised land is coming. Revelation 21, one through six. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. God had uh, coming down from heaven from God. God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He dwelled with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne, behold, said, behold, I am making all things new. He said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. One day, the promised land is coming. But for now, we are walking in the wilderness. And what do we do? We look for him. We look for him in our midst and we learn to walk. I'm going to close with Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and bloom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and it shall rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Shannon, Sharon, and they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance and with recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. For the waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water in the haunt of jackals where they lie down the grass shall become reeds and rushes and there shall be a highway there and it shall be called the way of holiness the unclean shall not pass over it it shall belong to those who walk on the way even if they are fools they shall not go astray no lion shall be there nor shall there be any ravenous beast come upon it and there shall they shall not be found there but the redeemed shall walk there and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they will shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Y'all the wilderness is not a waste. As Stacey Thacker says, the wilderness is the place where the redeemed learn to walk. The wilderness is the place where we are positioned to see God in a way that we wouldn't otherwise see. So let's keep our eyes as we walk through this wilderness on our great God, the almighty creator who is sovereign Lord over all the earth. Let's be resolute in our trust, steadfastly minded in our pursuit. Let's follow him knowing that he goes before us and behind us to guide us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He does not leave us or forsake us. He is Elroy, the God who sees. His eyes have never left you, not once. He provides springs of living water in the midst of the desert. He rains bread from heaven. He gives us rest. He parts seas and divides rivers. He defeats the enemy and is victorious in all he does. He is our banner. He is jealous for us, knowing that our very best lies in full surrender to him. He is faithful to do all that he says. He is immutable. He never changes. He is Yahweh, the God of the promised land, the God of the wilderness. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. 
He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your presence with us in this wilderness means we lack nothing. May we remember that. May we cling to that truth. May we always remember to keep our eyes alert, steadfastly locked on you, looking for you in our midst, seeing the way that you are working and providing and showing us who you are, even when we walk through the hard circumstances. And Lord, one day, one day, we'll all be together again together in the promised land. Lord, where you will wipe every tear from our eye and there will be no more pain and no more sorrow. But until that day, Lord, teach us to walk as we walk alongside you. It's in your name I pray, amen.